Good morning, everyone. I don't know if this thing is working or not. It doesn't sound like it. But um, anyway, uh, thank you for coming today. Um, we're here, gathered here today to um, celebrate the life of a very special person, uh, Durango Mendoza, who was my father, or well, it was my father, I guess, um, who passed away unexpectedly about a year ago. Um, uh, Durango was a, um, a loving husband, uh, father, brother, grandfather, and friend. And um, he was also an artist, a poet, and a storyteller. And um, he loved to talk to just about anybody he could, any stranger, and tell stories and, you know, befriend them. And, um, you know, today we're taking this day here a year later to remember him and for I know we had really small services the first time when he actually died so um, you know we're trying to invite more people now so that everybody can have a chance to actually you know remember him and uh, uh, so anyway um, I'm gonna keep this short but uh, I guess we have a whole uh, Things set up here today. Um, we're going to start off with, uh, I guess, some musical selections, and then a couple readings, and then uh, I think we're going to open it up for anybody who wants to say anything. So, uh, and then I think afterwards we have um, like snacks or something in the room. Coffee and granola bars. Coffee and granola bars. <laughs> okay. And I also know there's supposed to be some sort of. Uh, like art exhibit, I guess that what it is, or yeah. later or in another location if yeah. people wanted to go see that at some point. So I'm not sure all the details on that. But um, anyway, um, I guess without further ado, we'll start with the music selection. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. The song that's playing is called A Mother's Prayer. It's by Connie Caldor. She's a Canadian artist. And um, I always know when Durango was settling in for a long day of work at his computer because that song would come on loud like her. <laughs> Thank you. 
And I want to say that we actually do have a brand new baby here. Um, <laughs> Joanna, Sister Rosalind's granddaughter, Alexander, and her partner, Jacob, have brought their, their daughter, Daisy Jewel. And they came all the way from Oklahoma. Um, and Daisy's what, a week old? A week old. So you might get to sneak a little peek at her. She's well covered and all that. But, um, yeah. Okay. Um, What's going on? What's going on is um, looks like William. Yeah, yeah William. William and Jack are going to come up and stand together, and we're going to read. Them. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess uh, mm -hmm. we're going to do a couple readings here. Okay. Yeah, this is Jack's and my son Will, and grandson Jack. All right, folks. And read a little something that uh, my dad wrote a while back. Uh, it seems a bit relevant. The loss of someone you love, for whatever reason, resonates inside each of us. Memories of good times, as well as interesting times, mixed with hopes and regrets, and the lonely time between what was vividly recalled and what lies ahead which we think will gladly trade for the continuation of what has ended. Time seems to have lost its value as a healer, and yet we go on. It is both a choice and not a choice as life continues. We have to look ahead to keep from stumbling. What we had helps us do this. Indeed, it requires it. So this is a story called April Fool, and it's by, written by my grandpa, so I'm just going to start reading. When I was about eight or nine years old, I woke up one spring day and I thought, hey, today is April Fool's Day. Now there was only me and my mom awake at that hour. It seemed no matter how early I woke up, my mom was already up, puttering around the house, getting things ready. So anyway... I thought, it's April Fool's Day. What can I do to fool my mom? What can I do? Then I had this great idea. My grandpa, my mom's dad, he hardly ever came to see us. But when he did, my mom was always glad to see him. So I got up and strolled into the kitchen. My mom was bustling around the wood cook stove, cooking stuff for breakfast, and it sure smelled good. I could smell the biscuits browning and the salt pork sizzling on a big black iron skillet. Mom looked at me and smiled. How are you doing, son? I strolled by and said, okay, mom. I went to the screen door and out onto the porch like I was going to the outhouse. The screen door was slapped shut and I grinned. I was going to fool my mom. So I waited a minute and then ran back into the house saying, mom, mom. Grandpa's coming, Grandpa's coming. And my mom, she stopped cooking and wiped her hands on her apron, touched her hair and said, ooh, ooh. I felt a huge lump form in my chest. I looked at her, so excited that her father was coming in to visit, and I felt very small and very far away. I could barely talk, but I said, April Fools, Mom, April Fools. And she stopped untying her apron and she looked at me. She just stood there and said, said it, didn't say a thing. I saw the brightness and her eyes had gone away. Then she kind of turned away and said, why don't you go play outside, son? She started to tie her apron again. Go on now. I moved slowly toward the door and pushed it open. I stepped out onto the porch and felt the cool morning air flood over my face. And I never lied to my mother again about anything that mattered. <laughs> That was so Durango. You know, he, he would put something out there and then he'd add a little twist. You know, I never lied to my mother again about anything that matters. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, um, yeah, so anybody from, uh, from the family who wants to come up and say something? Yeah, I guess we can open it up for family members to, you know, anything they want to say. 
and then and then we're looking at budget for. Uh, <coughs> We're making this up as we go along. Yeah. <laughs> you would want it that way. Yeah, yeah actually. He's really good at extemporaneous speaking. And he was, like, he called himself Mr. Soundbite because he could say something and get quoted just like that. Yeah. So they interviewed a member of a museum in Chicago, a peace museum. And somebody in the New York Times was there interviewing people who were there. And Greg and I were there with our, our two youngest. And, um, the, the reporter was interviewing me and trying, I could tell after a while, he was trying to get me to say one particular thing. And finally he fed me the line and I said, oh yeah, that's right. But he talked to Durango and Durango's the one who got quoted extensively, paragraphs. Mm -hmm. all the lines. <laughs> he said the stuff that was really right on. Hello, thanks for being here. Um, I'm so glad we got this working. I just wanted everyone to be able to see these wonderful pictures and my husband Ben put this together. and It's, it's beautiful, so thank you. Um, I, um, I often tell this story, so you may have heard it before, but I just think it's so important to share because I wanna share something that dawned on me just recently with all of you related to this story. When I was really little, um, um, well, most of my, my, my childhood, um, the safest, most comfortable place was with my dad. And he just had a warmth to him and a way of looking at the world that was like, no other person I knew, but it was also a way that I wanted to be. And, you know, Dad did a lot of found art, and he would do assemblages, and he saw art everywhere he looked, and I always wanted to be able to see that way. Um, but I also always wanted to please him. And so he would find pieces of rust on the ground, and on the, you know, and, and pick it up and turn it into a sculpture. And, and I said, well, how do you know what to pick up? And, he said, well, it just spoke to me. And so I would go around looking for things and, and bring them to him and say, Dad, how about this? Does, does this speak to you? And he was always so kind about it. And he's like, oh, yeah, does it speak to you? Um, and I think um, what I'm realizing is is that his art was, his photographs in particular, you know, are, are him looking at us and seeing all of us and they're such gifts. And then his, I just, I think so many of you in here have been photographed by him <laughs> and just know that was him seeing you. And um, I take a lot of solace in that and yeah, that, that's the one little thing I wanted to share is that I take that with me now, his art and his photographs. That's him seeing the world and seeing us. And I wanted to read this one little quick thing and then I'll get down. This little artist statement that um, from a short return, it was in one of the texts, it was published in several different textbooks. And one of the cool things when I was growing up in high school and I was in high school, one of my English teachers came to me and she goes, is this your dad? <laughs> and I, I was real shy and I was like, oh yes, but the pride that I felt. Um, but anyway, the, this story at the end, I had never read this until more recently and it was last summer and it was, or the summer before dad died. Um, and I read it out on the deck one day and I just couldn't stop crying. It just was so, inspiring to me and just I felt like I learned a lot about my dad just from reading this artist statement or this from the author so I was going to share it with you it's from the story um, a short return um, and when you go around I think there's um, ways to listen to the stories um, oh yeah at, um, at art group there's a listening station there's a listening station and I, I read this one for that listening station um, 
So I'll just read it briefly for you here, just this from the author. He says, as a young adult, my, my childhood was remembered as a series of emotional highs and low spots. These early years are all colored by the perspective of an introverted child. It seemed that the sight lines of my vision of the world slanted upward from me. Things and people and events loomed over me. The ground, the grass, and the details of floor level life were closely sensed. The time came when I began to realize that my perspective grew less and less slanted as I grew, both physically and emotionally. One day, I crossed the plane between childhood and maturity and began to feel that I could comfort comfortably look backward and forward. And if not understand them, at least sense that life had different meaning for different people at different times. This is the state of mind I was exploring when I wrote A Short Return. I did not analyze it then, but the process, taking a series of emotional vignettes and giving them a time, a setting, and characters, enabled me to express my feelings about the past and look to the future with my emotional accounts balanced. Is this story about, uh, is this story based on real life situations? Yes, if memory serves and has survived the child. Thank you. He was my brother. He, he was the best brother in the world. Whenever I needed him, he was always there. My one memory is when my mom was when mom was in the hospital, and I said that she wasn't going to make. I called him up, and he talked to me, and and we. Uh, I felt so much better. So the next day, mom was doing better. So I called Jean and told her. Mom was fine, and I felt better to tell. Uh, and to me, he was always tangled. So I told her to tell him. And she said, after he got off the phone, he, he was calling train stations, bus stations, airlines. And he was on his way down. He was always there for me. And I, was, I felt like I tried to be there for him. Whenever Gene was gone, I would call him up. We'd talk on the phone, or when he was just here, we'd just talk about what he wanted to do when he wasn't here anymore. And I just, he was just a, he was best brother. He, we would bring, I would bring all my grandchildren up here to visit them from, the oldest one is 30 now, and they all came. And uh, this one right here, when he was, what, three years ago, he, yeah. First time he came up, he was a little shy, but we were walking and we heard him say, Gene. And uh, William was walking back there holding his hand. And he said he watched him slowly, slowly walk backwards and then he reached to him and <laughs> held his hand out. And he said that was just the best feeling in the whole, whole world. But he was always there for me. I was always there for him where I tried to be. And uh, we just talked about about different things, and and uh, he, uh, as he got older, he liked the uh, uh, traditional stuff. He uh, he always talks about one night we went to a ceremonial ground, and we were standing there in the dark, and he said he just a man came up with a small bench for us to sit on, and he said that made him just he just felt so good about that. And then we'd go to another one, and he talked to this elderly person for a long time, and he just wanted to connect to the earth 
the desk, everything. And, uh, but he, and uh, a big part of me went with him. But I have all these memories and I'll, I try to write them, put them in this little thing so you won't hear my whole book here. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he, he was just, and one person he really liked talking to was our uh, Uncle Doc. And Doc always what told him, he said, you need to get out and celebrate with people, do get together with your family while people are happy, not when they're sad. So we would always try to, we started getting together, having birthdays, having, just to get together. And uh, so we, in a way, we're trying to make this time a happy occasion too, celebrating his life. So, uh, I'm not real, I've been taking the Creek language, but I'm not real good. And uh, if he were to be buried, you would go to throw a handful of dirt in there. That's how you said goodbye. It was their last handshake. And to uh, Tango, I say, Adam to each other is, you know, gauges. Thanks everybody for coming. And Tom, and during those youngest, arguably most charming and handsome son. <laughs> it's still a debate, but fair warning, um, there's a decent chance I'll start crying during this. Um, if that happens and I melt down, just imagine I said something meaningful and it's like, <laughs> all right. I don't think I have to tell you all how amazing my dad is and was, but I'm going to anyway. At first glance, my dad was a simple man, humble, quiet, and unassuming. While he was all those things, underneath the surface was one of the most creative and complex minds you will ever meet. Kind and compassionate, he cared so deeply for everyone, especially his wife, children, grandchildren, and his whole family. And his example was the imp and the impact it had on me inexorably shaped me into the man I am today. He had a quiet charm about him and had the ability to impress those around him with thoughtful anecdotes, kindness, and words of wisdom and of course, the occasional dad joke. <laughs> Humble man that he was, I honestly don't think he realized just how much he meant to those around him, which is too bad, and I really wish that we'd all had a chance just to tell him that. <laughs> I imagine if he were here today, after we all left, he would say with a small smile something like, that was really nice. <laughs> I kind of avoided sharing thoughts about what he meant to me specifically, mostly because I could not get through it. <laughs> But please know that I'm eternally grateful to have had him as my father. <sighs> I miss him every day. I really hope I get to see him again. sister and uh, he was the best good brother anybody could want or have uh, he always even when he was out uh, in different states he would, if mom needed him to come back take care of us when she went to the hospital he and Marco would come and stay with us and they just take care of us and play with us and have a good time and he was, he was real good I could tell that he loved us all and 
and his uh, wife and children and grandchildren. And um, every time he'd come to visit, it, oh, we'd go visit him wherever him and Jean were staying, and uh, he'd have his uh, computer all set up. And uh, every time I'd come over there, every time he'd say, you see my grandchildren? I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd go to the, the whole computer, his grandchildren, and, but he'd say that every time, you see my grandchildren? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And he was proud of those grandchildren and children and wife and but he was he was the best big brother and even when I was little, when he would come back, he would take take me places and just you know, just make me feel special. Uh, like he had that I don't know it was an old green mercury, he would come and take me for a ride and he'd take pictures of me, him and Robert would take pictures of me. I'd be sitting on sitting in the car with Robert, get take a picture. I'd be sitting in the car with Durango, get take a picture. <laughs> they just made me feel special, and uh, he was um, uh, even like during uh, our growing up years, he would come back and he would take us bowling and skating and just take us to the movie. He would one time when I was like about three, he took us to the movies, and I didn't know what the movies were. The drive-in. And he piled us all in his car and took us out in the country. He parked the car and turned off the car. And um, there was this big screen. And I said, "What's that?" And he said, "That's a giant TV." And I was little, so I was just talking and talking. He said, "Now, if you don't be quiet, that giant's gonna hear you. He's gonna come after us." <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't say any more after that. And uh, but he, he was he was funny and. I would always, um, when he was around, I would always like like to uh, talk to him about, you know, we'd always have puns going back and forth, and sometimes he'd say, hmm, why didn't I think of that one? <laughs> but he was, I just really, I thought he was a best big brother. And, um, uh, let's see, Thursday, before he passed away, uh, I called him on my lunch break. And I told him I wanted to call him because I kept I had a dream about him that he was um, like just well, you just saw well and nothing was wrong with him. You know, he was just talking like, you know, uh, he didn't have a stroke or anything and he was just happy and healthy. And so I told him I wanted to call him at my lunch break and tell him that about that dream. I said, You were just fit as a fiddle. Mm -hmm. I said, Oh, thank you. <laughs> and he said, and um so we talked for a long time, and I uh, have an hour for lunch, so we talked quite a while, and he, um, uh, I told him, I said that um, I was wanting to come see him that weekend, and he said, well, he said, um, when the, everything's over, he said, you can come up and visit, and when I got home, I told my daughter, I said, I want to go see him this weekend, at least just see him Saturday. She said, well, when all this is over, I'll take you there to see him. And he passed away on Monday, and I really felt bad. Because I didn't do it. And I wish I had, this one hadn't done it, but I didn't do it. And, and uh, we came up here, and when we went back home, you know, I just felt real bad because I didn't do what I wanted to do. And then, after I got back, I don't know how long it was after I got back, I had a dream about him. I dreamed that I was at work and he had come to my place where I work. He had been there before, years ago, and I dreamed, in my dream, he came to see me at work and I was so happy to see him. I ran over to him and I hugged him and I said, Durango, I love you, I miss you, I wish you were still here. And when I hugged him, it just felt like I could feel him. And uh, he looked at me and he smiled and he said, don't worry, it's okay, everything's gonna be okay. And uh, after I had that dream, uh, that feeling about, you know, I wish I had done this and felt bad about that, it went away. I guess because he assured me that everything was gonna be okay. And he always knew how to say the right things. 
to all of us. And, uh, you know, I just want to let you all know that he was my big brother, and I was proud of him for being a big brother because he was the best big brother anybody could have. Thank you. I'm um, Duringa's niece. My mom is Margot, the oldest of all of them, the oldest in the whole family now. <laughs> and um, she's about to be 79? 79 on September 1st. And she's, you know, trucking along. But um, she, um, and there's a picture in here where. She and Uncle Roberto and Durango and her, and she's standing in the middle, and they're, they're in the, and I took that photo, and that was when Durango turned 70, and they were welcoming him into the 70, the 70s club. <laughs> and um, Mom always had good, good stories and everything. And um, anyway, she and my dad, they just couldn't make the journey, so I just wanted to um, say that they're really happy that everyone's here. And um, he actually did, uh, my mom was really upset when she heard, and we were all quarantining and everything. I couldn't go over at the time. She was pretty upset for a few days. And then like my Aunt Marianne said, um, he came, she felt this presence um, at breakfast, like a few days later, she was eating, and she just felt this, this, really calming presence and just said, you know, it'll be okay. And so she said she felt a lot better after that and she thinks that he's 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 making it okay. So thank you. Hi, I'm Will. I'm a, I am grandpa's uh, grandson, and he is my grandpa. Um, <laughs> uh, I I don't have a I don't really totally know what to say, but uh, uh, I remember always getting to go places with grandpa. We used to go out to nature places. Uh, I know real specific. Um, like we'd go on like walks. We'd go see birds. We'd go to the um, we come do things, and uh, I also remember though. I remember uh, whenever Grandpa would come over to visit, um, I'd always, almost always, we'd sit down and we'd draw together. And I was most of this happened when I was really little, and so I draw like a stick figure, and then Grandpa would draw something that actually looked like a thing. <laughs> I'd be really impressed, um, and uh, and uh, I get really sort of happy nostalgic because I still have. I saved, I think, every single one of the drawings that he made. And so I have a little folder of all the drawings that uh, Grandpa ever made with me. And uh, I like going through those and looking at them, and it uh, helps remind me of him. And uh, yeah, thank you. I sat next to the wall just so people would have to look at me a little longer when I came up. Uh, I'm Ted, uh, Durango's brother-in-law, uh, Gene's brother. Uh, Durango and I shared something in common that was a love of making things with our hands. 
the difference is that uh, I would liken myself to a framing contractor and Durango was a Finnish carpenter. Um, we shared something else in common, and that is we gave part of our digits uh, in pursuit of our love of making things. Um, Durango and I shared another thing, uh, sort of. Uh, I like to cook, and Durango liked to eat my food. Uh, and in particular, he would always ask when they were coming over whether there would be Ted beans, which probably were not very good for him because it's baked beans with a lot of brown sugar in them. Thank you. I, I'm one of the several Wills. Um, he was previously introduced. I am one of Durango's sons, his middleest son. Uh, we're kind of talking about, you know, his impact on the community and, and how he's affected, you know, people. And to me, it was kind of one and the same. Uh, he was very gentle, uh, very protective is the wrong word. Uh, comforting, I think, maybe is the right one. Uh, he's always kind of there for people, as, as some of those have mentioned. And so these days, I am a big fan of horror movies. Anything with terrifying imagery, I'm all over it. But this was not always the case. Uh, and I remember when I was little, Dad took me to see Jurassic Park in the theaters. And I was so excited. I was a huge dinosaur buff. This was going to be the greatest. However, uh, turns out, Dinosaurs are big and scary. Uh, mom had the right idea. She came in late. She missed all of the like glory and wonder parts of the movie, you know, like the six stegosaurus and the huge brachiosaurs and you know all of the the wide-eyed wonder. She came in right at the scary part and walked right back out. Um, <laughs> but I decided to stick it out, um, and you know, I was I was like, yeah, I'm going to be brave. I'm going to have a good time because it's going to be so fun. And uh, but I was clearly having a, a bit of a rough time, and uh, I just kind of like quietly reached my hand over, my tiny little hand, and Dad's big old uh, woodworking missing parts hand. And um, he just quietly held it and uh, got through it. It was fine. One of the greatest movies I've ever seen, and a quiet moment with Dad, but one of my favorites uh, with him. I actually, a few years later, for a school project, uh, we were supposed to make a plaque for somebody that meant something important to us. And I actually wrote down that little story that he didn't even remember. Um, but I put it on there because he didn't make me feel bad. He didn't draw attention to my fear or my anxiety. He just did what he needed to do and held on for as long as I needed him to. And uh, anyway, thanks, Dad. And thank you all for being here. Mom actually made it through a few minutes of the movie. She just had her like facial expression, her eyes were just shut. Horror is not my genre. As I already said, I am my grandpa's grandson. Um, <laughs> And I just wanted to tell you guys a story about um, there. there's this tree stump in their yard. And uh, it was really big, and we wanted to, and they wanted to get cut down. So what we did was, we, Grandpa let us go get a hatchet. Don't worry, he supervised us. He wasn't letting us use hatchets. And he let us like cut up at the wood. And I just thought it was so cool that he was letting us do this. Because he did all this stuff so many, many times with us, and I, I, I really miss doing that stuff with him. Thank you.
My name is Roberto Mendoza. I'm Durango's older brother and the oldest male in the family. Um, the thing I remember about Durango mostly is that we've traveled a lot together. Uh, we would go walking in the woods to places we'd never seen before, like an old rundown log cabin. We played the, the river, I mean, the, this creek that surrounded our, our place that we lived the longest in the country. But as we got older, he followed me to New York City where I became a filmmaker. And uh, he didn't come to, I don't think he came to California, but that's when our paths started to diverge a little bit because I became a radical and he became more of an artist. But we both cared about people and humanity in, in our own in our own ways. And as um, as I got older and got more involved in politics, like I just recently came back from Jackson, Mississippi, where I organized a project down there, he became more supportive of the work that I was doing and you know supported me whenever I came through town. He would always give me some money. I never have to ask for it. And um, because he knew that I was on Social Security and, and didn't have a whole lot of money. But um, toward the end of his life, he, he appreciated what I was doing and I appreciated that part. And I was thinking before he passed away that I wish somehow he would move back to Oklahoma because I felt that he was, he would be a huge model for a lot of native Muscovy youth if he was down there working with them. And they would really, really appreciate him. So, okay. Hi, um, I'm Ava. I'm one of Durango's granddaughters. Um, I don't know, I think my fondest memory I have of him that like I always think about is how willing he was to like do things for us. Like I remember going to him and he was sitting in his little like chair thing, you know, in front of his computer. I don't know what he's doing, probably editing photos or something. But <laughs> and I remember going up there and being like, Hey grandpa, can you make me a sword? Because <laughs> I found a sword he made for like my dad or Tom or something. I don't even know whose it was, but yeah, and I was just like, you know, I want one too, so can you make me one? And he just went, sure. Got up and went in the garage and was in there for like an hour. And I remember being a patient kid I was and going in there and sitting on the steps of the garage door and just watching him. Like, I wouldn't say anything, I'd sit there. And he'd always do the same thing when he was in there. And he'd have that really old, stereo going with like some random news channel or like some random song that I didn't know and I always remember he would like the way he walked it was like really sh he'd shuffle his feet you'd hear his feet on the concrete of the garage just shuffling he wouldn't say anything to me he wouldn't even look at me he's just doing his thing he's screwing things on moving around I don't know it's like wholesome to watch him just do stuff and I'd sit in there and then I'd get bored and leave and come back and then he'd come back and give me a story. He's like, here you go. It's made out of like a railing and some random piece of plywood he found in there or something. It was great. I'm pretty sure I saw it yesterday. <laughs> yeah. And I remember like bringing it out and then Scarlett being like, ooh, oh, too. <laughs> he would just like make swords out of like random stuff he found in the garage. And I don't know, that was like a really fond memory that I have of him because I feel like he was like at peace when he was like building stuff. You know, we were never allowed to go in the basement because it was like scary. Uh, but like after he passed away, we were able to go down there and like he had a lot of stuff down there that I didn't know about, like artwork or things that were in the process of being made and stuff. Yeah, I don't know, like, I miss him a lot. He was definitely like a huge role model. Sometimes I feel like I have to like, I don't know, 
because I love art and I'm an artist and I want to pursue that. And sometimes I feel like I'll never be able to like be as good as he was. Or like, I, ho I hope he's proud of me, I guess. I'm just going to interrupt here to say one of my favorite memories of Durango with Ava is, um, she probably won't mind if I say this, but Ava had type, type 1 diabetes, and there were times when her blood sugar would go really low, and she would just be so tired. There was a time that that happened, and she just kind of went over to Durango and sat on him on his lap, and she just kind of melted and fell asleep for a while and, until she recovered. And I, that was just so sweet. And he was willing to sit there, you know, and just hold her and let her be there and let her get better. Anybody else? Oh, Sarah, you yay. Um, I'm Scarlett. I'm Ava's sister and one of his granddaughters. And one of my fondest memories is actually not really about me. Um, I was with Grandma in the kitchen making sushi, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and Grandpa had gone to some sort of festival thing, and he came back with one of their like flower arrangements and reproposed to grandma in the kitchen and gave her a mason jar bracelet <laughs> ring. <laughs> and it was really sweet and it yeah. was really nice. And then I made him, also he didn't like the sushi because he didn't like the smell of um, the shrimp that we put in it. So I made him a like sandwich sushi thing with like just sandwich stuff. Yeah, rice paper sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> that was a really nice memory. I'm Kaya. Um, I'm also one of his granddaughters. Um, and this isn't necessarily a memory, but I like a specific memory. But I remember when I first started showing an interest in poetry, because like Ava, I'm an artist, but not of the visual type. Um, some of the stuff that I wrote didn't really make sense. Like to other people, it was kind of abstract or like reforming um but something about my grandfather is he never made me feel alienated about that he just supported us no matter what we did I'm not really into speaking in front of people, so, but since my siblings came up here now, I gotta come up here. Why is that weird? So, um, Grandpa has always seen more in us, I feel like, than I saw in myself. Sorry. Um, I never thought of myself as an artistic person or really involved in the arts that much. Um, which is weird because like, my dad does art and Ava does art and, you know, everybody kind of does art in this family for some reason. <laughs> and I never really was into it as much as everybody else. It was pretty and I could appreciate it. Um, but it was never really like something I thought I was good at or even really knew what I was doing with. But he always encouraged me to do those things. Um, really helped me keep a creative outlet, even though I felt like my siblings were much more in tune with their art. Um, I can say that every time I did art, even if it was something that I was just messing around with or 
not even really like trying. He always tried to make it seem more, much better than it really was. <laughs> um, but I always appreciated that uh, to make it seem, uh, I don't know, just something really great and inspiring. And I think it was just really nice that he could see deeper into things. And honestly, it made things way easier to, like, I could look at things and appreciate the beauty in them more. Uh, when my younger siblings would make things, I could see what they were talking about, and I could see, like, the kind of vision they had. And ever since then, like, I've seen Ava and Scarlett and all of them, even Kao's uh, poetry. I've always really been into it, so um, I can appreciate the art, as, even if I can't create as well as everybody else. So that makes me happy. Yeah, I don't know what to say, so. This is the girl who ushered us into Grand Parenthood. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if anybody can see this picture. I looked at it, but there's a behind my dad and his mom. There's a little mustard yellow car, okay? And that car was a really big part of our life, my sister and I's lives for a very long time. And uh, one of the things I loved about my dad is that, you know, I don't remember how many years it was, but he loved to travel. And even though he didn't have a ton of money to do it, he did it anyway. We all, like every summer for, I don't know how many summers, it was at least two for like a month. We'd all pile into that little mustard yellow car and like pick a direction in the United States and like go all the way to the coast and check it out and stop and, you know, just explore the United States. Um, you know, of course, we didn't have the money to stay in hotel, fancy hotel rooms or anything. So we would camp at every single KOA campground that, there, you know, there was in the United States probably. And then, um, you know, it was just... I was really thankful for that because I was able to see pretty much the entire United States when I was a kid. And uh, I mean, even though we had to sit in the back seat for hours and hours on these drives, and then one year we even brought the dog with us, <laughs> and she sat up, you know, that's a little hatchback on the little hatchback part, panting on top of us, basically <laughs> drooling on it all the time. It was sweet. But uh, that poor dog. But uh, yeah, there's no air conditioning, I believe, in that car. But um, But anyway. You know, that was, you know, a pretty special part, you know, time that I spent with him and Gene King, you know, on the trips too. And then, of course, my sister and I, you know, tried not to kill each other. <laughs> but, um, you know, I do treasure those moments, though, so, and I always remember them. Mustard jar. It's called a mustard jar. Yeah. Um, Ben. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Ben. I'm Amy's husband, Durango's uh, son in law, only son in law. Best son in law. Best son in law, tallest, shortest. <laughs> Ironically, the one with the most hair. <laughs> yeah, I'm really winning on all counts. Um, when, so, so we've all had a long time to process the loss of Durango, and, and I keep on coming back to what, what is it that I miss most about him? Um, and it's hard, right? It's hard to determine what that is exactly, but, but when I was listening to everyone speaking today, there was one sort of common theme that I found, and that's the way he looked at the world. And that no matter what situation you're talking about, whether it's uh, the the sword out of random scraps of wood, or like the like the tree stump in the yard, he saw the best in all of us, right? And I, I started thinking, like, well, what's a really good exemplary story uh, to highlight that? And, and here we go. So we live in Glen Allen. You probably have all heard of it. Uh, <laughs> it's about a half hour west of Chicago. And he and Gene would come up frequently and visit with us and hang out. And it was a really hot summer day. 
And so uh, we were all just sweltering. Um, Durango was wearing a long sleeve shirt and jeans because that's what you do. Uh, pocket filled with who knows what. Um, always a pocket protector, always lots of pens, and always a spoon. And, and I remember that, why is there a spoon in your pocket? Well, here we go. So it's a hot day, and we've been walking around for maybe 45 minutes or an hour, kind of ducking into stores, trying to get air conditioning when we could. And uh, Durango, very in tune with his body, knew, like, I need, I need to eat a little something. And, I, and he said, well, I'm kind of hungry. And I said, well, do you want to stop and get some? He said, oh, no, I have something in the car. And I was like, 95, what are you going to get out of the car? I think, oh, perhaps some almonds. No, no, he, he'd gone and gotten a, uh, like a cup of yogurt. And I thought, wait a second. And I said, oh, was that in a cooler? He said, no. And he sat down on the bench and he peeled open this yogurt. By the way, plain. There was no flavor in this bad boy. And he started eating what had to be the hottest yogurt that anyone has ever consumed. And, 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 I, and at first I was like, oh, come on now. I'll buy you another yogurt. Um, but I think that that's how he saw the world. He said, well, to me... A hot cup of yogurt, not, not by choice, but to him, it's, like, it's fine, it's good. Um, and so I think that's what I miss most about him, is his ability to look at a hot cup of yogurt, <laughs> pick, apply that metaphor as you will, uh, and to see the best in the world. Right? So thanks very much, and thank, thanks so much uh, for all of you being here. We really appreciate it. I was going to share... Um, something that was sent to us um, said to me uh, by a couple that are very fond of Durango but aren't able to be here uh, today. Uh, Victoria Ford is, um, she was an um, art teacher and I met her decades ago and she and I were, well she was a student teacher at the place where I was teaching. And <clears throat> then years later when she was working at, at Barksdale Elementary, she invited, to Dur invited Durango to be the artist in residence there. Um, and this is what she said when she wrote, they're not able to be here, but she wrote yesterday and said, I want to share the particular sweet memory I have when Durango was a visiting artist at, sorry, I'll get up here. Okay. I want to share the particular sweet memory I have when Durango was a visiting artist at Barksdale and worked with my fourth grade art students. They loved him and his approach to making. They learned so much about using the materials at hand and construction techniques. They also learned the value of patience and the ability to change one's plans if something doesn't turn out like you hoped it would. These were the skills Durango modeled for my students. We all had such a good time and the students wanted more Durango when his visiting artist stint was over. We all wanted more Durango. And we will miss his easygoing manner, his sense of humor, and his encouraging words. And that's from Victoria and her partner, Stephen Dewan. Do this, Brenda. <laughs> this is uh, Dr. Brenda Farnell, um, and we've known her since forever. 96. 96. <laughs> okay, yeah. And she's going to read uh, what uh, what Stephen, Victoria's partner, said. Um, I'll stand here and, and move it for okay. you. Oh, that one also mess it up. Okay. okay. Is that good enough? Okay. 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 Thank you, Jane. Sure. And hello, everybody. It's a real privilege to. I know some of you, I know Will, I know Tom, um, from the many invitations uh, <laughs> to your house. Uh, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, when we were the small group, and it felt like a sort of clandestine group, because we were the ones starting to fight that wretched mascot. Um, and Jane and Durango's house was the, the headquarters for a while. <laughs> so uh, Steve Calhoun was one of my colleagues in that struggle. Um, and uh, he and Durango became friends, uh, and as we all did. Yeah. And this is, this is what Steve is, is saying. He couldn't be here today. Durango was the epitome of the best in humanity. And fortunately for me, he was my friend. We would often meet, unplanned, at the Urbana Farmers Market, at a campus event, protest, or just serendipitously around town. Each time, with an extraordinary ease, our conversations would pick up on topics of mutual interest. He was a source of wisdom, honesty, and camaraderie. He was a person I could always count on when I needed support. I think we all share, share that. We shared one unique experience that may interest you. 
On August the 4th in 2005, Durango and I drove to Indianapolis at the invitation of Miles Brand, then president of the National Collegiate Athletic Association. We had been given the opportunity to speak before the NCAA's executive subcommittee that was considering the use of Native Americans as sports mascots. This committee was comprised of chancellors and presidents of NCAA member colleges and universities. I was very nervous. Durango was cool. <laughs> Not wanting to be late, we left Urbana early and arrived with plenty of time for me to take Durango to Shapiro's, a deli that served food more aligned with my tribal and ethnicity than his. I hear that matzo ball soup is pretty good. I'll give it a try, he said. I had my usual, a corned beef sandwich on rye with a celery tonic. For dessert, we had rugelach, a pastry Durango immediately took to. Pastry. Thus, <laughs> thus fortified, we made our way to the hotel where the NCAA was holding its annual meeting. As we waited, finally called into the ballroom, we separately worked the committee members during their break. And then Durango spoke, informing them about the negative consequences the stereotyping of Native Americans as sports mascots had especially on children. I followed, and then we departed for home. Not knowing whether we had had a positive impact, our consolation on our ride back to Urbana was the extra corned beef sandwich and rugelach I had gotten earlier. The only thing I was certain of, of that night was that Durango was now a fan of Jewish food. <laughs> the very next day, the NCAA announced their policy that prohibited the use of Native Americans as mascots in intercollegiate sports. Thank you for your wisdom and support, Durango, Durango and thank you for being my friend, Steve. Thank you. That's a wonderful, wonderful memory. And um, it's so lovely to hear the tributes from family and friends, uh, most of whom I don't know. But um, I'm very proud to be here and talk just a little bit about Durango's um, presence at the university. Um, not only was he an artist in residence at uh, the local school that Victoria mentioned, um, he was a very important presence as we were not only struggling against the mascot, but in countering that, we also started uh, an American Indian Studies program and a Native American house, which was a cultural center for the few Native students that we had, brave enough right, to be in, in, on our campus. And Durango was, as you all know, he was this wonderful, calm, courageous, dignified, and yet humble presence that was so important to those students. Um, I remember inviting him to come to um, some of my classes. I taught a course on American Indian languages and cultures, and he would come. And he was, for most of those students, he was the first living Native American that they had ever encountered. And it was a profound experience, because there he was in his full, full presence, sharing poetry and stories and his photographs, and most of all, his sense of humor. And I don't think any of them went away uh, ever forgetting uh, that encounter. To the students at the Native American house, of course, he was this elder. You know, he was this elder who was, again, this calming presence, giving them the courage to stick to it, to make that presence felt, even under those very difficult and challenging circumstances. And there's never a day go by that I don't walk into the Native American house and expect to see him. You know, we really, really do miss him. And... Um, uh, I'm also reminded of um, his photography. Uh, he was always at the Native House taking, documenting our events, and we have this wonderful archive of photographs because of that. And over the summer, I've been working um, on a book project with uh, Monique Mojica, the actor and playwright. And um, we were looking for some reference to something uh, just last week. And she came across um, a CD-ROM and uh, some printouts from the CD-ROM that Durango, Durango had sent her oh. um, after she had been an artist oh. in residence and uh, we produced her play, Chocolate Woman Dreams the Milky Way, on campus and we're writing a book now about, about that project. But it was so serendipitous that she just 
you know, looking for something else, came across Durango's generosity. You know, he had taken the trouble to make a CD-ROM, print out the photographs, and send them to her um, after she'd been here. And um, one of those things he, he did all the time, he created this beautiful composite of photographs from mm -hmm. her visit um, into a sort of one-page um, composite that, that I have a copy of too. And I was looking for it, and I noticed typical Durango, it was titled Page. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Benja. Okay, I'm, I'm mindful of time and knowing that some people might have to um, do some stuff. Um, so, um, are we about ready for this? Yeah, yeah. And we have some family members who are going to provide some foliage. While they're coming up, I'll tell you a really quick Durango funny because Brenda reminded me of this kind of thing. Um, Durango had to start running a CPAP machine after um, the brown water accident in 2010. And um, it took a long time to get to where we could, um, where he could figure out what kind of mask he needed. Um, and he ended up needing a full face mask. And the first month that he was able to make it through the entire night with that mask on, um, I had waken up in the morning to really go somewhere. I said, sweetheart, sweetheart, time to get ready to take a little for her appointment. And he sat up and he took off his mask. And with the greatest disappointment on his face, he said, how'd you know it was me? <laughs> <laughs> things I wanted to say about my sweetheart, um, and I'll try to make them shorter than they turned out when I was typing them up. Um, <clears throat> I learned early on in my relationship with Durango that I couldn't necessarily expect him to give me a straightforward answer, even to the most innocent questions that I asked him. Um, for example, he might come in the room and shift papers around and open a cabinet door and clearly be trying to find something. 
um, and wanting to be helpful, I would ask, what are you looking for, DM? DM was my very clever nickname for him. Um, and so, what are you looking for, DM? The love of a good woman, he would say. And then he would quickly and very wisely follow that up with, and here you are. <laughs> or words to that effect. And I would feel flattered and loved, and even if I sometimes groaned about how corny that was. Um, but still, nine times out of 10, he never told me what it was he was trying to locate. <laughs> and I can't count the number of times that happened uh, during our 40 years together. Um, since October when Durango died, I began a process that I'm, I'm told happens to virtually every surviving spouse or partner. Um, our relationship with our love continues even when our partner isn't there to interact with. Um, and so uh, we look back with benefit of hindsight and we take stock of what we had, and then we sort of test and retest our assumptions about our absent one based on evidence they've left or what we remember. So we're constructing something without necessarily without um, you know, any new input. Um, and you know, we, we ask ourselves, um, what, what was it that this essential relationship really meant to us? And who was this person that I loved? And who this person, for some reason, loved me back. And what can our time together mean to me now um, and, and to my future in this world that I really am in reluctantly right now, you know, without him? And a friend from our Oak Park days wrote to me recently um, and said that Durango was the most complete person he'd ever known. And my first thought was, yes, yes, he was. And then I realized I sort of had to sort out what that meant for me. Um, because he wasn't complete in the sense of finished and not growing anymore. Um, he certainly wasn't stagnating or lacking in curiosity. So I, I just decided that it meant that he was mostly comfortable in his own skin um, and in the life he was creating. He wasn't a restless seeker, um, but he was never complacent about his world. He was always interested in making some kind of changes for the better. Um, sometimes that made him a little difficult to live with, <laughs> if you had just done something you were pretty happy with and it wasn't quite right, but that's okay, because that's, that's learning. Uh, Durango and I had been together for just a few weeks, so he asked me to go with him to something called a life planning workshop. Um, it was, um, Dudley, where are you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was led by a gentleman who's here today. Uh, didn't expect him to be here, but there he is. And I want you to know, Dudley, this really meant a lot in our lives, and I'll tell you how it got there. Um, this consisted of a set of really interesting exercises that were designed to help the participants visualize and express what they wanted their futures to be like. Um, and presumably then, they can plan what they need to do to get there, once you have an idea where you're going. Um, and afterward, the two of us, as a new couple, we sort of hesitatingly shared, like, if I tell you this, will you still like me? You know. Um, and it seemed to work out um, because um, after we did that, we, we sort of moved on the day-to-day -day relationship building. And we did both save those folders that we created that day somewhere. Then in October, after all the family had left our, our house following the visitation, I was down in the basement and I was deciding whether I was going to sort through all that stuff that Ava referred to <laughs> that, that Grandpa had collected, um, all the stuff that spoke to him, like Amy said. Um, that he intended to use in his art. And it was just overwhelming. I, I turned around to go up back upstairs, and my glance fell on something that I hadn't seen in decades. It was Durango's life planning lab um, folder, and sitting on top of a cardboard box, uh, where it hadn't been the last time I was in the basement. And I was like, what on earth? I don't know where that folder had been, or who left it out where I could see it. But I found that I needed really badly to read the thoughts that he'd had back then as a 34-year-old single father. The remarkable, 20, the remarkable man my 28-year-old self was already in love with. And I pretty much devoured every word of that connection to him, to our past. I was especially struck by his answers to the prompt, what do you hope will be true of you by the end of your life, or words to that effect. And nearly everything that he listed had been true for him by the time he died. By the time he was 75, he had done the things that he wanted to do for the most part, or at least begun to address them. He wasn't finished by any stretch. And then time stopped for him. 
He helped to have happy children and grandchildren. Happy was in quotes because, as he told me then, his idea of happy might not be their idea of happy. Um, and that was first on his list. And he also um, wrote that he wanted to come to terms with how he was going to handle the talent that he was aware that he had. He wanted to touch people's lives in tangible ways. And it was so comforting to read that and to think that at age 75, he might have been able to read the list himself and nodded, feeling like he had done much of what he wanted to do when he was in his mid-30s, much, much of what he wanted his life to be. And of course, he wasn't there to point out what was wrong with my interpretation, so I get to hold on to that. <laughs> <laughs> but the wonderful comfort and, and wonder would stay with me and held me up for quite a time. Then one of my projects was to finish um, something he had started the summer before, which was going through his office and throwing away what needed to be thrown away and keeping what needed to be kept. And that meant going through his papers, including some stories and poems that he had um, written when he was in his late teens and early 20s. Uh, there was his statement of philosophy paper from the summer before his freshman year at University of Missouri, where it seems to me that everything he's saying um, kind of became more and more deepened as he grew older, and that he really didn't change that much from, from what he was thinking then. Uh, I mean, he changed, but it didn't veer off into someplace else. Um, and then there was his paper on his career goals, which he wrote on the cusp of turning 19. Um, and if you like, you can hear that paper read by grandson Will um, at the listening station at the Art Coop. Um, and, but by the, that, um, I lost my track. Um, by the last day of his life, Durango had gotten to do almost everything that his younger self imagined him doing professionally. Um, and the earliest writings that he saved um, about life and death and love and the cosmos and points between, those are remarkably similar to what he expressed aloud and in writing during the last decade of his life. Um, the last poems that he wrote, you know, he was thinking about death. It was very close to him. Um, <clears throat> and his feeling was that after his death, he wanted to literally become part of the earth, what sustains and, and renews life. That was how he imagined um, that it would be for him, and um, we made arrangements that, that we'll do that. He wants to have his ashes combined with mine and scattered, but we're also going to make sure that, that those in the family who, who would like to have just their own place to have Durango can do that too. Um, he wasn't, he wasn't um, chasing after wealth or fame, and he, he wasn't um, seeking enlightenment or any of those things. Um, so I asked myself, what, are you look, what were you looking for, DM? Um, and so I had to piece that together. Um, but it seemed to me, after a lot of thought, that much of his journey in life could be described as trying to get home. Um, and I capitalized home in that because it was more than just a house or a place to be. He used to sometimes say, um, home is where you have to, where, where, oh, back up. Home is where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. Um, and that's kind of a minimum standard of, of home. <laughs> but um, we know that he wanted more than that and that he gave more than the minimum to make home. He meant to have a home that was a space for physical and emotional belonging, partly of his own making, where spirit and heart and physical self could rest and create in safety, a place full of love. And... I think that after many turning points in his life, at least from his early teens on, he was asking himself one way or another, how will I get home from here? And that would be get in the sense of traveling to it, arriving at it, as well as defining it and having it and creating it. And I know that's been true for my 40 years with him. Um, that's, I saw that over and over. Um, he was aware early on, probably in his bones, that he came from the people whose homelands were stolen, whose physical, emotional, and spiritual connections to their traditional places on the earth were brutally disrupted over generations. His own childhood home was broken, then reconstructed in ways that both held him and marginalized him, and he writes about that in, in some of his, his writings. Ultimately, he had to and was able to create a very different space, a very different life away from where he grew up. As a young man, he set up home and married and became a father. And when that marriage ended, he entered the life of a single father, 
One of the first things he told me about himself when we were dating was the kids and I are a package deal. He knew that he could never have home without, he could never have the home he wanted without Rob and Amy. Um, and he felt that way about William and Tom too when they came along. Um, that it wasn't a trip without the kids <laughs> along. <laughs> That was a real trip sometimes. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, like Rob, it, uh, you know, good memories, but also it's like, I won't tell the story about Holbrook, Arizona, but the kids know it. <laughs> uh, um, and he chose work that enabled him to, or engaged him rather, in helping other children have homes where they could be safe. Even if it was there a minimum standard of care, his goal was, that the kids would be safe and they would have a place where they were cared for. And he tried his best to make sure that the parents who were having difficulties could learn some ways to be better able to, to create those homes for their kids. And Brenda mentioned Native American House. He really felt strongly that Native kids needed a place to, well, kids, you know, college students needed a place to be on campus that where they could feel comfortable and feel um, you know, feel a little bit of home, away from home. Um, and he, he worked hard on that. He felt that without American Indian Studies, without the Native American House, it was never going to feel anywhere like home. Um, and I read things that he wrote from when we were first together in the last 10 years of his life, and I choose to believe that insofar as was possible, he found and made and had a home that he wanted. Um, it wasn't perfect, we weren't perfect, um, but I think, I think he was okay with being with me. I think that uh, when we were together, far away from home, we still felt like we were home because we were together. Um, he didn't end up near the mountains in the Pacific Ocean, which um, as his 34-year-old self had hoped at the life planning lab, um, but he was making choices then because when we had opportunities three different times to move there, he weighed the options, and we chose Champaign-Urbana. And I've lost the rest of what I was going to say, but um, I guess I just wanted to say that um, I feel like Durango's quest was for home. And oh, I wanted to add something about community. Durango didn't always find it easy to trust community. Um, and I, I can't really say too much more about that, um, just that um, there were, you know, the more people you know, the more drama you might fall into, and that's very challenging and very hard, and Durango liked a calm world, and he could be calm when there was drama, but it, it did, it could tire a person out, could tire him out. But in Champaign-Urbana, we met so many people who made it feel like a good home, a good place to be. And um, we, had, we had bought um, my parents' place in Texas, um, in far south Texas, and we had been going down there for three years, and we had met some really good people down there, and you know, beginning to get the sense of, of um, people that we could feel at home with. And three of them are here today. They made the trip. Thank you so much, Gary and Janet and Lynn. Um, I think that's um, that's it for me. Does anybody else want to say something? You didn't get a chance to. And if, if you don't feel like coming up and saying something. In the coffee room, we have um, Durango's green messenger bag from, oh, from the Rivers Corps of Discovery that we were part of. Uh, it's a citizen science project that we did from 2009 to 2011, something like that. Um, <clears throat> anyway, and he used this bag to carry art supplies into the field when we were you know, documenting um, the nature of uh, the ecosystems of the rivers and streams of central Illinois. Anyway, and there's some paper and some pens that if you want to write something that the family can read and then tuck it into that little messenger bag. That would be awesome. That would be sweet. Um, and what's next, Bob? Is there music? Oh, yeah. Uh, it says, community sing along. What a wonderful world. Yeah. Somewhere on your pew is a sheet of paper that you're going to have to share with somebody. Um, because one of Durango's favorite songs was Louis Armstrong's version of What a Wonderful World. Um, and he, he liked it, even though he knew that when it, um, 
was recorded by Louis Armstrong, the black man, that, that um, you know, it was, it was before Martin Luther King's assassination, it was after the Freedom Summer murders. Um, he knew that it was, he knew that Louis Armstrong was singing it as a black man, not as, um, not with blinders on, but he was singing it as an affirmation. Um, and Durango liked this song a lot. And I'm going to get on in a second. And if you're willing to sing, please do. I only heard Durango sing one time. He had a beautiful, sweet tenor voice. Um, but he was shy about singing. The only time that I heard him singing when he was singing to Rob and Amy, he was singing um, Mom, along with Mama Cass's version of, um, uh, what is that one? Um, Say Night Night and Kiss Me, Just Hold Me Tight and Tell Me You'll Miss Me. Dream Little Dream of Me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He sang that. Trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me, and I think to myself, oh, what a wonderful world! I see skies of blue. when I was um, reading stuff that Durango had said about, and when he would tell stories to people about his art, some of the things that he created, so many times um, he would refer to his father-in-law, my dad, as someone who was kind of there with him, um, helping him make stuff, like giving him sassafras saplings, or telling a friend about him who had some interesting wood. Or the one time Durango had bought some um, baby moon hubcaps and he wanted to use them for his, for his sculptures. And some of you know this. Um, um, they, um, he told my dad what he wanted, how he wanted a couple of them to look like. And um, so my dad got his shotgun and the two of them took a couple of baby moon hubcaps to the edge of town and put them face down in a ditch and shot him at close range to get the effect of, of um, you know, the bursts on one side. And, and if you go to the, um, to the art coop, you'll see the, those, um, you'll see those sculptures. But he enjoyed telling that story about, about my dad. Um, and, you know, his dad wasn't very present in his life. He didn't meet him until he was 13 or 14. And, um, one time, my, uh, Durango was talking to someone, and um, 
he was describing what had happened, and, he's, or, and he said, my father and I. And he actually meant my father. And I thought, okay. that was the only time that I heard him do that, but I feel like it was really significant um, to him. And you know, my mom's just crazy about him. And um, even though she's kind of losing a lot of her memory, um, she hasn't forgotten that Durango's gone. And um, one time I was over there and I was starting to cry and um, she just, she said, I know this is hard for you because it was Father's Day. And he said, she said, this must be a really hard day for you with Durango gone. So she's remembering that even though there are things that she forgets. So anyway, um, I just wanted to bring my parents into it. So. Okay. Sure. The last one is? Uh, okay. Oh, um, when Rose was talking, um, she she used the Creek phrase, Hadam G. Chaffis? Did I do that right? Hadam G. Jaffis? Yeah. It means, I will see you again. And, um, when we had the, the, um, the visitation back in October, um, I had said goodbye to Durango, and my sisters-in-law told me that that's not what we say. We say, Hadam Ji Jeffries, which means, I will see you again. Did it actually say, my mom told me, in all the American cards and maybe other indigenous peoples, we don't have a word for goodbye. Mm -hmm. And so we always say, we'll see you again. See you again. Yeah. Thank you, Cholula. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. yeah um, but the closing selection, do we have that, Ben? Do we have the um, sweet by and by? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thanks. Thank you, everybody, for yeah. coming today. And you know, it's nice to hear that everybody, you know, had a special moment or you know, had something to say yeah. you know, about my dad. Yeah. And we all miss him. Yeah, I do. Like Victoria said, we all yeah. like more Durango. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. That was good. And then we hope that we'll get to see some of you. Checking out the exhibits before they close today. Yes, yes. Um, um, I forget. I think Art Group closes at five. Uh, the library closes at five, um, and City Hall is open all the time because it's actually the police station. But um, and you know you can go in and look at this stuff. Um, and if you. Um, We'd love to have you stop and get coffee so we can chat with those of you that we didn't get to yet. Um, and then um, maybe, I don't know, the caravan or something up to the, up to, because um, the, the three venues are just like within walking distance. Well, if you're not in the, you're not, they're not they're in walk, within walking distance. They're a few blocks apart. And, um, you know, I didn't do that. Oh, I didn't make a map. <laughs> Yeah, you can start with the library. The library has photographs and has eleven photographs, and then um, the um, art coop has some photographs, but it also has the sculptures and it has a video that was put together by our videographer Sam, um, and it, it contains. Oh, there you are, Sam. We're sitting. <laughs> um, it includes readings of several of Durango's um, writings, like um, um, some of them he's read and some of them um, Amy and Ben read one, Will read one, Tom read, I don't know if the toothpaste on there, but anyway, yeah, but it'll be growing. This is a project that my dad wanted us to do and, and he made it possible um, that we'll have recordings of a lot of Durango's stuff. Um, so, I think... I don't know if that's yeah.
Big switch, read the box, comes fished, oh. or survive. That's okay, it's not it. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs>